The Medium Witches Movies allows for the viewer to be transported to all kinds of terrifying and demented places. If someone can think of it, they can create it. But something which has always been far more terrifying to me is the things which firmly plant a heavy foot in reality. Sure, a psychotic, undead, murderous maniac with a hockey mask is a harrowing experience on paper, but no matter what, it's always going to have that notion of fiction hanging over its head. But real life, that's where the real monsters are. We're all undoubtedly familiar with the depravity of which some humans are capable of, and may be aware of many notoriously famous serial killers who stack a high body count. But when you think about it, the best serial killers are the ones we don't know about. The ones who have been at it far longer than they can remember, killing more people than you could possibly fathom. You don't know who they are. They could be your co-worker. They could be someone you pass on the street. They could just live a matter of minutes away from you. You just don't know. And that's what this movie is about. The Poughkeepsie Tapes, a fictional documentary, found footage movie covering the actions of an exceptionally deranged killer who meticulously documented each and every one of his crimes with a video camera. A fake documentary which at times sounds too insane to be possible, yet while still feeling entirely possible. It starts with someone filming a funeral from a distance, which has this rather sinister feel about the whole thing, as if they're deliberately hiding away from the public eye. It's intertwined with home video clips being played of a seemingly young, happy, energetic woman named Cheryl Dempsey. Before it then cuts to a nighttime scene of someone at that very gravesite, where they appear to be messing around with some sort of hole, then suddenly a corpse is ripped from the ground with a rope attached to a vehicle. We learn through a series of different interview segments with various different people working in the FBI that there are a series of different videotapes. Videotapes which have captured up to thousands of hours of various different, absolutely shocking and horrific crimes. We learn that the agent who was tasked with watching all of these tapes was forced to watch over 2400 hours of these many barbaric acts. We see the absolutely overwhelming amount of tapes which were produced by this killer. Just for scale, we see a man walking down a line of hundreds upon hundreds of videotapes, and then chillingly, he states that the vast majority of them were about one victim, Cheryl Dempsey. Before the viewer has really been exposed to anything horrific, we already know that nothing good is going to be contained on those tapes. Clearly, this is some sort of sick and demented serial killer who is obsessed with documenting his crimes. And that leads to the question of, for what reason? To gloat? For pleasure? A compulsion? We just don't know what would compel someone to commit these horrific acts, never mind tape them. After learning that the tapes also contain over a hundred hours of bizarre balloon-related content for some reason, we then see his first ever victim. Well, at least the first ever victim that he ever recorded. Who knows what came before he picked up the camera. The man notices a small girl playing out on her front yard. He approaches her and begins to talk to her in a friendly way. After he manages to distract her by having her look through the camera, he bludgeons her over the head and kidnaps her. It's theorised by the FBI that this was his first ever victim, as it seemed like an opportunistic crime, a crime of chance, because he just happened to come across a vulnerable, unsupervised person and just acted on impulse. Once this little girl's body is eventually discovered, we learn that not only did he murder this poor little child, but he also raped her. And judging by what we learn about him later on, that part most likely came after the killing. The FBI state that this must have been an impulsive act, because everything else that comes next would indicate towards him understanding that he's actually very good at this. He's found something in which he can excel and succeed at. Which just happens to be violent murder, dismemberment, and sexual assault. The next documented crime of his is much different than his original. It appears to be meticulously thought out and practiced, to the point where he knows 100% what he's going to do and how it's all going to be played out. 
He plays the part of having a broken down car on the side of the road. He's picked up by some friendly strangers who agree to drop him off at a nearby gas station. After directing them to pull off onto a more secluded road, he attacks them both, incapacitating them before they have any chance to react. He'd planned this by faking to be broken down in the perfect spots in order to direct these people to the gas station, which is actually abandoned and unoccupied, and having them head down a very low traffic area. He knew exactly how this whole thing was going to play out. A forensic pathologist who examined the bodies informs the viewers of the unfortunate fate of these victims. Both the man and the woman had been decapitated, and the man's head placed inside the woman's abdomen before being lit on fire. Not only is he interested in killing these people, he also clearly takes great pleasure in the act of dismembering these corpses and arranging them in rather sinister ways. For the killer, the fun doesn't end the moment the victim stops breathing. More like, the fun just begins. The FBI managed to track down a gas station security camera which catches the man. However, he's covering his face and signing something towards the camera. He's signing Red House, as if he knows the tape will be watched when an investigation is underway. We learn that the second body was actually discovered in a wooded area behind a place called the Red House Tavern. Another indicator towards this being a premeditated act and not impulsiveness is that he was signing that to the camera before he had even met the people he would end up killing. This was all planned out from the very beginning. He went out with the intention to kill. When it comes to this serial killer, this type of behaviour doesn't even scratch the surface of all the foul, despicable things this man has done. From what we learn about this killer, these kinds of acts just seem like your normal everyday activity to him, something which is so regular to him that it almost might start to feel a little mundane, which would explain why things only escalate from here on out. Not only is this man particularly skilled at murdering his victims, he also appears to be incredibly smart, especially when it comes to disposing of the bodies and avoiding police detection. He would regularly cut people into smaller pieces and scatter individual body parts in multiple different counties, smartly knowing that not all police stations conduct investigations together and might not make the link to other body parts, and knowing that it might take years for all of the individual parts to be found. We learn one of the reasons he would go undetected for so long is that he didn't have an identifiable MO. Like most well-known serial killers do, he had no pattern, he had no preferred way to kill or dismember victims. It's almost as if, to him, it didn't matter how he did it, he was gonna have fun doing it in whatever way. Which is further emphasised by the fact that he would regularly switch between power tools and normal handheld tools in order to cut up bodies. Obviously, power tools would be a much more quicker and efficient way of cutting right through a human corpse, but he liked to switch it up. He liked the personal act of taking hours upon hours to saw through a human corpse with a handsaw, purely just for the sake of doing so, even if he had access to much more efficient methods. This is someone who's figured everything out. He's got this whole business of serial killing down to a T, and he enjoys it. We then go back to the case of Cheryl Dempsey. We see how it all started between him and her. Before he does anything to her, we see him stalking her on multiple occasions. He sits watching her as she leaves college or school, and has some sort of device that allows him to listen into her phone conversations while outside in his vehicle. The killer learns that Cheryl's parents are out of the house, and that it's just Cheryl and her boyfriend home. He begins to slowly and methodically sneak into the house and take his time with the whole ordeal. He removes a big knife from the kitchen and hides in her bedroom cupboard for possibly multiple hours, until he thinks it's the right time to leave. He sneaks his way downstairs to the living room, where Cheryl and her boyfriend are half asleep on the couch. They get up to begin getting ready to go to bed, and once the boyfriend separates from Cheryl and heads into the kitchen, he strikes, stabbing the boyfriend. He turns around, notices Cheryl just saw the whole thing, and sprints over to her, snatching her up. This person has absolutely no hesitation or anxiety about committing these acts. They seem to have absolutely no problem in sneaking into people's houses and being literal touching distance away from some of his victims. It's almost as if it's part of the fun to him. He was right behind them as they both lay defenceless on the couch. That was a perfect opportunity to do something. Yet he didn't. He savoured the moment. Until eventually, 
he struck. After savagely stamping the boyfriend's head into the ground, and spreading his insides all over the house like Christmas lights, as one of the agents put it, he takes Cheryl back to his basement, which also doubles as a dungeon. We see he has her bound, unable to do anything, where he then begins to brutally torment and beat her repeatedly. Things are going to be different between him and Cheryl. In the past, he would just murder his victims and play around with their corpses, but now he's going to brainwash this woman and turn her into his slave. He begins by beating her until she refers to herself as slave, and then begins to psychologically mess with her, make her think her whole family has been killed and that she wanted them dead. He also holds her head underwater for extended periods of time for not doing exactly what he wants. The killer is so brazen in his acts that he even returns to the scene. Right after the mother gives an appeal to the media with multiple people around her, he walks right up to her and lets her know that if there's any way he can help, she should let him know. He forces Cheryl to wear some kind of costume and gives her a mask to wear, and then he keeps her for years, slowly but surely managing to brainwash her to be his quote, slave, and it works. While having Cheryl locked up in his basement, he continues his savage murder spree, but this time targeting prostitutes only after the town start to catch on that there's a serial killer prowling their streets. This time, he's posing as a police officer, arresting women, and then, well, murdering them. He brings some of them back to his basement, where we see Cheryl is forced into watching him commit these acts, and on one occasion, he even forces Cheryl to kill one of them. But judging by how fast, and with how little hesitation she showed while doing so, I doubt this is the first time he's made her take a life. It turns out that this entire time that he's been murdering prostitutes, posing as a police officer, he has been doing so to pin the crimes on a real police officer. He plants fingerprint evidence at a scene, and multiple different DNA samples believed to be taken from a fertility clinic where the police officer used in the past to set up an officer named James Foley. And it works. Of course it works. Everything this absolute psycho does works. After the trial, we find out that Foley is found guilty, receives the death penalty, and then is subsequently killed for it. Just as an officer puts it, this killer successfully managed to kill a cop using the justice system as a weapon. All it took was a 10 year plot, a little bit of DNA and crime scene tampering, and a cop was killed for it. Now that's dedication to death. The police and FBI discovered that James was indeed innocent after the killer drops off a map at James's old police officer buddy's house, with the map containing a location and text saying, you missed one. So not only did he set up this police officer over the period of about a decade, but then he also gloats and torments his friends. This person seems like a real stand-up guy. We then see him tormenting another one of his victims, a lady he picked up from the side of the road while posing as a police officer. He begins to torment her in a rather theatrical way, by walking around on all fours in a pretty unsettling manner with a mask on his head, before he then slowly punctures her neck, killing her with these metal rods attached to his fingers. This man has devolved into such madness at this point that he's acting out bizarre, ritualistic, theatrical performances for the camera as he torments and murders these victims. He's got away with it for so long and killed so many people, it's all just one big game to him now. By purposely leaving a digital trail of breadcrumbs, the killer allows the FBI to find his house, containing the overwhelmingly large amount of videos, as well as an alive Cheryl Dempsey being contained in a wooden box. After being missing for nine years at this point, Cheryl is finally free and able to be with her own family. Unfortunately, due to all of the extreme torture, sexual assault and brainwashing, she doesn't quite see it that way. She is completely lost from reality after all of these years of abuse and suffering from Stockholm Syndrome, claiming her undying love for the man who did this to her and that he'll be coming back to get her soon. Two weeks after giving an interview to the documentary team, with us discovering she now has a missing hand due to the abuse, she takes her own life, leaving a note behind, declaring her undying love for the man who abducted and abused her for years. Just like with the police officer being framed, he has managed to take another life while not directly being the one to end it. It's all fun and games to this guy, as if he just set himself a challenge to see if he could succeed at it. 
It then loops back to the beginning, with him removing her body from her grave, and then the police stating that they never did manage to catch the man. Despite everything, he's still out there somewhere, perhaps in another town or city, but one thing is clear, there's no way a man like this is going to stop taking lives. Somewhere, people are starting to disappear, with no pattern and with no rhyme or reason. The best thing you can hope for is that it's not anywhere near you. And to go full circle and reiterate what I said at the beginning, the most horrifying and disturbing things are the things which take place in reality. The Poughkeepsie Tapes has that dark, unnerving feeling about it that is very much based in reality. Perhaps not to the extreme lengths in which this individual went to, but we all know these types of things happen. They happen all of the time. The world is a dark place. Perhaps this movie is a commentary on the epidemic which is serial killers in the US, which also takes several jabs at multiple different establishments, like the FBI, the police, and the justice system which is supposed to be in place to protect, yet manages to fail people over and over again. Or perhaps, it's just a dark, disturbing, realistic tale set in the confines of reality of what a deranged, murder-crazed, dismemberment-loving, extremely intelligent man would do given the chance. The people who are the best at committing these horrifying acts are the ones you don't hear about. The ones that are out there right now, slowly, smartly, and methodically picking people off, one by one. Before I wrap things up, I just wanted to say a big thank you to my patrons. Thank you to Dom, Bort, and Hunters263. Most of these videos get little to no ad revenue at all, so it's great to know that there are people out there who like my content enough to the point where they actually want to help financially support the channel. So thank you so much, guys. Also, the channel's got a Discord server, so if you're looking for a place to discuss this movie or other movies in general, there's a place where like-minded people can come together and do that. And also, if you wanted to leave me a movie recommendation, that's probably the best place to do it. So once again, thank you so much to my patrons, and thank you to everyone else for watching.